we should start. It's good to see everybody here on this chilly Sunday morning. Praise God we have this warm place to meet, huh? Great to have you all here. I hope you're ready for some more wonderful lessons from the Old Testament. If you are, please take up your Bibles and open them to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 10 is where we're going to, <clears throat> we're going to pick it up for today. And what we're doing is finishing a passage that we began to study through last week. It's kind of a part two, if you will, um, as we work our way through chapter two. So last Sunday we talked about, well, we went through a summary of Solomon's life that appears in chapter two and verses one through nine. And we saw that the king listed many of his personal achievements and his experiences for us as the readers. We took his kind of his royal works and we sorted them into five main categories of human activity or really five different things that consume the lives of all people who live under the sun. I mentioned the fact to you that men, they keep themselves busy with these types of things because they're seeking some temporary relief from the effects of the curse. And whether we're talking about a life that's given to entertainment, consumption, business, relationships, or possessions... All human efforts ultimately lead to the same place. God has ordained that fallen men would find no satisfaction in earthly pursuits. And so it's not really surprising that King Solomon would come, Solomon would come to the same conclusion. Remember that the search itself is meant by God's design to drive fallen men to despair, to not have confidence in themselves. Ecclesiastes uses two phrases to describe this, sore travail and vexation of spirit. Those two things are very powerful influences. The lost that read this book are intended to be broken by the absolute vanity of a life that is missing spiritual substance. That's really the main point of all of Solomon's observations and all of his arguments. That's the purpose of the book. So the king finishes off that portion by stating, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem, also, my wisdom remained with me. He wants us to know he's tried everything, and he's applied his supernatural wisdom to the situation, and so the results that he records in Ecclesiastes are both reliable and they are repeatable. And so we can either read about it and apply it to our lives, or we can just experience it for ourselves. We don't really need to do that when we have God's word. So that brings us to verse 10, which is really... Just a continuation of the same line of thinking. So let's read the text for today, which is going to be 10 through 17. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit unto the sun. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath already been done? And then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity, for there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. All right, as I said, our passage for this week picks right up where last week left off. And both of them are part of the larger narrative and context of chapter 2. Last week we learned about how to deal with things like humor, possessions, and business in a godly way. And this week the scriptures are going to teach us something else that is critical to understand. This is a little different of a lesson today. The subject of this message is how to hate your life. Now, I know that a lesson like this, with a title like this, it's going to be in real high demand, right? We know that most people, if you took a poll, are really hoping that their lives would turn out poorly. 
I don't doubt that everyone sitting here wishes that their day was a little bit harder and less satisfying, right? It's said that misery builds character. And so this morning, I'm going to give you a crash course on how to start hating your life immediately and also how to do it better than anyone you know. <laughs> Three points. Three ways to drain all of the enjoyment and satisfaction out of our earthly existence. And you probably think I'm being facetious or sarcastic, but I'm not. Look back at verse 17. King Solomon is forced to admit, therefore I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Did you know that depending on your perspective on this life, you're either going to have a great deal of fulfillment or satisfaction, or you are going to have a great deal of despair and hatred? It's all about having the right perspective. The text says there was a time when the king hated his very life. And how would you like to conclude everything we've seen in chapter 2 like that? Think about all these accomplishments and all these works, and that's the end result of all of the time, money, and effort. In the end, all of the things you've poured your heart into have brought you nothing but dissatisfaction, disappointment, and hatred. Pretty miserable, right? Well, as Christians, as those that are saved and redeemed, praise God, we have a calling and a direction in life that is entirely separate from the audience that's confronted in Ecclesiastes. We have spiritual resources and priorities that guard us from so many things, so many things we take for granted. God's word and the life of the Holy Spirit protect, guide, uplift, and sanctify his children. We're no longer in bondage to the vanity and the vexation of spirit that's mentioned so frequently in our text. But though scripture says we have received all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, it is still entirely possible for a believer to wind up in a spot where they are exposed to the effects of evil choices. It's entirely possible for a Christian to choose to live like a lost person in certain ways and in certain areas of his life. And to whatever degree that this happens, we will suffer certain consequences. We'll reap the same pain and heartache and instability that a lost person does. Though God often protects us from the effects of this world's sin, he will not deliver us from the results of our own disobedience or ungodly affections. So as we consider a few thoughts on this subject, please take a moment to evaluate whether there are certain spots in your life that are being lived in conflict with Scripture. Are any in this room or listening suffering some of the effects of sinful choices or misplaced priorities? Obviously, if our title today is How to Hate Your Life, then the opposite is also going to be true, because the Lord does not intend for any of his children to live a life of hatred or dissatisfaction. There may be some trials and there might be some difficulties to overcome. We might even have to endure the opposition of others, but even in the midst of those things, our lives should still overflow with gratitude and love for God and for the new life he's given to us. Now, what are some things that we can practice if we really want to end up despising our lives? Well, the first point is presented to us in verse 10. It says, Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. If you want to hate your life, really hate it. Always give yourself whatever you want. Don't hold anything back. The first thing that Solomon tells us is that whatever he desired, he obtained for himself. Now, I realize this message is extremely countercultural, and it's also very aptly timed. I didn't decide to be preaching about possessions and spiritual priorities in between Black Friday and Christmas. That's just where we are in this text. Obviously, when Solomon says this, he's talking about everything he already mentioned in the first nine verses of this chapter. But that list, it wasn't all inclusive, and so he makes sure that we know that he's run down every lead and he's really tried everything that he could. Remember, we're talking about the wealthiest ruler to ever sit on the throne of Israel. He literally had access to anything and everything that money could buy at the time. It would kind of be the equivalent of a modern-day billionaire. This is something that it could acquire anything that this world can come up with. None of us rise to that level of wealth. Well, I can tell you that I certainly don't. I don't know about some of you. All of us are incredibly wealthy, though, by the world's standards. We live in an age that is more prosperous than any that has come before it. And we also live in a country that is unmatched in this area as well. And all of us, if we're willing to admit it, are far richer and more privileged than we could ever deserve. God has truly blessed us. 
Now, it's very interesting how a book like Ecclesiastes, it gives us a bit of a paradox regarding wealth, opportunity, and riches. On the one hand, there is nothing sinful or wrong about having lots of money or about being blessed by God materially. Solomon will go on to tell us and explain that there are certain things that God gives to all men and especially to believers that are appropriate and are lawful for us to enjoy. So the application here is not a matter of selling all your possessions, making sure you have no money, and moving into a cave in the desert to make sure you're being spiritual enough. That's not what it's about. That is actually the same heart problem, it's just demonstrated in a different way. The issue brought to light in this book and the sinful condition of all men separated from God is the heart of one that would try to find some measure of purpose or joy in their possessions or their money. You'll see two key words in verse 10 that really drive home the problem with this. Those words are joy and rejoicing. It says, I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. Joy is the Hebrew word simha, the same word that's translated as mirth back in verse 1. Rejoiced is the word semia, and that's the only time it's used in Ecclesiastes. But it is translated other places in the Old Testament as glad, joyful, or merry. And the key here is that these two words in proper context, they're talking about a joy or a gladness that has nothing at all to do with the Lord. Nothing. In fact, we can see that this text says, this was the portion of all my labor. Now look at how many pronouns you can count in this verse. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. That's eight references to himself. Are you starting to see a little bit of a problem? When we forget that everything, anything and everything we have, is really the Lord's, and that he's simply given us certain things to steward in this life, we quickly fall into this very type of thinking. After all, why on earth would I withhold my heart from any earthly joy? Aren't these things the portion of my own efforts, of my own labor? That word portion means a share or a part. What I believe is deserved to me or owed to me. Basically, Solomon is saying that he fully expected a certain measure of satisfaction from his work because he'd worked hard and he deserved it. How can you begin to hate your life? Well, first you give yourself whatever you want, and if that isn't bad enough, you can follow it up by rejoicing in your own works and then expecting those things to bring you joy. All of that's included in verse 10. Now, it's very interesting. One of the things that's so interesting about Ecclesiastes is the way you can pick out similarities between what the world believes, what lost people believe, and what is described in this book. The world will often recognize the truth revealed in this text without really dealing with the underlying reasons behind it. Remember last week I talked about all these different philosophies, the fact the world recognizes them but still has no answers whatsoever. Now a couple of examples came to my mind as I was working on this message, and I'm not endorsing either of them, but it just is an example out there in the world. How many of you have read or are familiar with the Lord of the Rings series? Most people, right? That little character Gollum, right, from The Hobbit, that book was actually written by a Catholic an unsaved man, and yet he recognizes the corruption that riches and power bring as he writes this book. Not just the corruption, but the hatred and the discontentment that follows them. In the story, this character's entire world revolves around this special ring that he has, his precious, as he likes to call it. And yet you'll probably be hard-pressed to find a more miserable creature in all secular literature. He ends up being so consumed with the value of this treasure that he's ultimately destroyed by it. Or how many of you heard, have heard of the book by Charles Dickens called A Christmas Carol? Again, I'm not telling you to go read these books, but I do want you to recognize that even lost people, they can understand what Ecclesiastes is talking about. Ecclesiastes is written on their level. I'm sure you're all familiar with the character of Scrooge that's described in A Christmas Carol. He's the quintessential selfish miser that's utterly consumed with counting his money, consumed with himself. Here's a quote from his nephew to illustrate what I'm talking about. Keep in mind, this is from a lost person. He says, 
He's a comical old fellow, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking he's ever going to benefit us with it. His offenses carry their own punishment. Isn't that interesting? He says his wealth is of no use to him. Despite the secular nature of this book, Dickens has recognized some key biblical truths that we're talking about right now. What do both of these fictional characters have in common? They're both trying to obtain some meaning from something that can never satisfy. Yes, they are exaggerated examples, but the point still holds true. Both of them hate others, and they really hate their own lives. They've gathered to themselves everything they can, and yet they're still totally miserable. The difference, of course, between the writings of men and the scriptures, just like we talked about last week, is in finding the solution to the problem. Because the world would say, you just need to be more caring and less selfish. That a person like Scrooge could be reformed through the proper application of generosity. Now, certainly any life that's lived by some biblical principles is going to be a better life for the person living it than without but ultimately, just trying to be less selfish with your things is not going to resolve the problem at all. As we've mentioned, the only way to escape the cycle of monotony and sheer vanity of this life is to enter into a relationship with the one that created us. Generosity can never bring you to God. The hard fact is this. People have every right to hate a life that's separated from God. They should hate it. There is nothing of substance in it for them. There is no real joy or meaning to draw from such a thing. And when you recognize that rejoicing is not the portion of all your labor, that you deserve nothing but judgment, God intends that you repent and return to him. And only in salvation can God completely reorder and reframe all of the physical, temporal things we might do on this planet. He's the only one that can not just thaw out a frozen heart, but give someone an entirely new one. He's really the only source of true joy blessing, and rejoicing. By the way, if you want to absolutely ruin your children, then give them whatever their eyes desire. More things will not make them any happier. It will actually result in you not just hating your life, but starting to hate your children. A child that is given everything they want is a person that's headed for certain disaster. Isn't it interesting that the lesson here is the exact opposite of the one taught to us by the world? The world teaches us that happiness is either to be found in having everything, hedonism, or having nothing, asceticism. And you can watch both of those philosophies at work or at war at our own culture and our own community. People either find satisfaction in owning more than others or less than others. But the underlying problem is still the same thing. It's not about the Lord. It's all about me and what I have or do not have. That reminds me of something my family is going through Proverbs right now in our family devotions, and we came to this verse. A man named Egger wrote Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9, and it says this, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. He's speaking to the Lord and asking for a proper spiritual perspective on life. He doesn't want to own too much or too little. He wants the amount of what he has not to matter. Rather, his life, his stewardship of all things, must be focused on the Lord. A fixation on how little you have in this life leads to problems just as much as a drive to have it all. And so, unsurprisingly, we find Solomon honestly acknowledging this very thing in verse 11. He says, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and all in the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Solomon looks upon everything he's accomplished, all the things mentioned in the first nine verses of this chapter, and he realizes that at the end, all of it, when detached from spiritual truth, is totally useless. Remember the question from chapter 1 and verse 3, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Here's the answer. There is no profit. There is no point to any of it. All the things that we might try to do in this life still fall under the theme of vanity and vexation of spirit. So as we answer the question, 
How can I start hating my life? Please follow these basic instructions. All you have to do is always give yourself whatever you want. And if you want to greatly multiply the effect, always make sure to give your children what they want as well. And under this first point, make sure you rejoice in your own works and then expect that those things will bring you some type of lasting joy. Practicing that is going to bring you to Solomon's conclusion in a hurry. And for those of you that are saved, how do we avoid this miserable result? Well, we know it's not just about denying ourselves things. It requires much more than that. I have an idea. What if we replaced all of the personal pronouns, I or my, in verse 10, with words that pointed our hearts to the Lord? A faithful Christian life is not about what I desire. It's about what he wants. It's not about what I can give for myself. It's about what he's given to us. It's not about rejoicing in my own labor, but about the joy of Christ working in my heart. And finally, it's not about what I'm owed, but about the worship that the Lord deserves. Folks, it's never been about how much or how little we have in our hands. It's never been about any of us in the first place. So how do we end up hating life? Well, beyond having a strong preoccupation with ourselves, the next thing we see in this text relates not to our physical possessions, but to some mental motivations. Verse 12 and 13 tell us, And I turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath already been already done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. Now recall that Solomon has given himself not just to understand the futility of physical work, but also the foolishness of human wisdom. Chapter 1 and verse 17 communicated this clearly, saying, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. The king recognizes that even the huge difference between human wisdom and human foolishness is still subject to vanity. For the more that you understand about this world the more you're driven to see the monotony and the brokenness of it all. In chapter 2, the vanity of human wisdom is emphasized as Solomon explains that even the wisest man in the world himself and the most foolish ultimately end up in the ground. Death is the great equalizer of all men. But even though some in this world may attain enough wisdom to understand that fact, that does not stop them from pursuing things that cannot fix the problem. And so if you want to despise your life, then follow the example here. You need to chase human wisdom and human understanding. Verse 12 says that he turned himself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. And here wisdom is intended to contrast with the terms madness and folly. Those two are synonyms for the same thing, which is foolishness, a complete lack of understanding. To behold comes from a single word that means to inspect, perceive, or consider. To hate life, you're going to need to give yourself everything you desire, both physically and intellectually. Here we have an inappropriate devotion to human wisdom and understanding. And remember, this is the kind of wisdom and understanding that only comes from the mind of man. It's not spiritual knowledge. It's not a godly level of understanding, and it has nothing at all to do with biblical truth. If a Christian intends to forfeit the blessings and the perspective that God has given, All he needs to do is start entertaining the same thoughts and ideas as everyone else. Though the world's perspective is so opposed to God's, there are still many Christians that operate like the world in a number of ways. Worse yet, believers may begin to desire the importance and the validation that comes through recognition by the world. Even though the Bible presents the faithful Christian life as being made as the filth of the world and are an off-scouring of all things, Christians are easily led astray by positions of power and influence. Who is elevated by our culture and media? Those that have a reputation for being wise and knowledgeable gurus. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And our culture is a mixture of both of these influences. Primarily, people are seeking the same thing the Greeks were in Paul's day. Men desire wisdom, and more than that, they desire the status and the recognition that comes along with having that reputation. Verse 12 tells us that Solomon turned himself once again to examine human wisdom and foolishness and the differences between the two. He says, For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? 
He's saying that any would follow any that would follow after him in this exercise are only going to arrive at the same conclusions. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. Because of this gift, he's able to state the facts without pride. Any person that gives their life to a pursuit of human wisdom is going to come up short in the end. And we can see that only a few verses later that this kind of misplaced priority, it only results in despair and hatred. Now, I'm not preaching against all education or about knowing things about the world in general. We do have to live here and we do need to know some things to minister effectively. But examine the lives of many that are considered to have a very high level of knowledge and understanding. And there is a reason why some of the smartest people in the world are also some of the emptiest and most miserable folks you will ever meet. Why is that? Because worldly wisdom and even grasping the difference between wisdom and foolishness cannot bring true peace or joy to life. And why on earth would a believer think that such things could do anything for them? We're going to see two results of Solomon's search in verses 13 and 14. Neither one of them is able to address the vanity and vexation throughout the pages of this book. The scripture says, Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happened to them all. First, Solomon notes that in terms of human wisdom, being wise does have more temporal benefits than being foolish. Earthly wisdom is to folly as light is to darkness. Remember the image of the sun rising and setting in chapter 1? The wise man is able to see many things that the fool cannot. Now we did discuss that these benefits do have some pretty questionable value. Verse 18 of chapter 1 said, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. This is one reason why an overemphasis on secular education can seriously damage the spiritual life of a Christian, and why those that are the most educated are not necessarily the most satisfied in life because an unspiritual attitude is never a healthy thing. Further, Solomon says something very important here, the phrase, that one event happeneth to them all. Like chapter 1 and verse 15, this is one of the key verses of the whole book. It establishes the context of Solomon's greater arguments. Clearly, the phrase, that one event, is talking about death, the great equalizer, the one thing that all men always have in common. The fact that Solomon perceived the power of death is something that plays a major part in the futility of human wisdom. It's hard to appreciate your life when a lifelong pursuit of understanding has only made the reality of death stand out that much more clearly. What a waste. Just as the previous point, which focused on the physical, Solomon comes back to another bleak conclusion. Then I said, then said on my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, that this also is vanity. Why will a pursuit of human wisdom make you really good at hating life? Because this is exactly the same conclusion that every scholar, wise man, and guru has been forced to come to, even if they won't admit it. The smartest and most popular men of our time, though they've risen to lofty heights and sit in their pride far above ordinary men, they're still nothing more than dust waiting to be scattered by the wind. Solomon is looking at all this from a purely earthly perspective, and though there's nothing above, as though there's nothing above the sun. What's the point of all the wisdom you might collect when your final destiny is no different than the fool's? That really puts the pursuit of knowledge into proper perspective, doesn't it? Isn't having wisdom thought to preserve you from the same fate as everyone else? That's one of the main reasons why many in the world desire it, because they want to be regarded differently than the common man. But the truth of the matter is clear. You can't escape your own mortality by applying worldly wisdom. Ironically, believing the gospel requires a person to give up this type of thinking. You can't come to the cross while simultaneously claiming to be self-sufficient or wiser than the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.18-21 through 21 drives that point home. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Why? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So if you want to have a useless life, if you want to hate your life, be sure to chase human wisdom and human understanding. And just like in the previous point, you can really compound the problem by encouraging your children to do the same thing. How many people do we know that have counseled their kids to devote all of their time and energy to secular education and secular knowledge? And how many do we know that have utterly ruined their children by doing that? It's not that we can't be educated. We just cannot allow such things to drive our lives. If you want to end up hating your life, then devote yourself to the same things that this world values. Now, before we move into the last area that's addressed by our text, I do want you to note the fact that Solomon is leaving no stone unturned with these arguments. Whether physical or intellectual, you cannot find satisfaction through your own efforts. All right, we're talking about some common mistakes on the road to a meaningful life. Solomon's giving us a broad description of his own experiences and his conclusions. And we can see that everything mentioned in chapter 2 leads us into the final two verses of today's text. Verse 16 and 17 tells us, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought unto the Son is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation and spirit. A life that's lived in connection with what's taking place above the Son will not result in hatred. This is the experience of the Christian. We that are saved have no reason to despise our lives, and the lost have every reason. Though this is true, Believers must still be cautious not to fall into the same thinking as the world or the same efforts and priorities and motivations. That's the purpose of what we're looking at this morning, and that's my main takeaway from this passage. Solomon tells us in verse 16 something he's already said in chapter 1. Nobody remembers us except the Lord. The wise are not remembered any more than the fool. In fact, the verse says that as time continues, all things that have happened are forgotten. Again, we've mentioned this before. Solomon's not saying we have no memory of the past. What he's saying is that the pursuit of human wisdom and the exercise of it can't bring any more eternal benefit to a person than the exercise of foolishness. The drive of the wise to obtain more understanding won't be remembered. Each subsequent generation believes that it is the one to figure everything out. That's a lie. Instead, history just repeats itself. That's not the main point I want us to take from verse 16. Yes, it is true that no man will really be remembered as he was, but how does this drive our behavior? The third thing that you'll need to do if you intend to live a life that you despise is to live like there's nothing beyond the grave. Live like there's nothing more important than this present life. I do want to caveat this by saying that no true Christian can really live exactly like a lost person. The Lord's discipline and the direction provided by the Holy Spirit will not allow it. But we certainly can make significant choices and we can go in a direction in life that makes it seem as though we have little regard for eternity. Any person that realizes there is ultimately no difference between the wise and the foolish, they might be tempted to just say, well, fooey with all of it, I'm going to live how I want. And unfortunately, most of the people that we encounter in this life don't even need to realize that to decide to live how they want. They just do it by default. It's often easy for us to absorb and then act on this sinful mindset. It's very much related to the first point we covered, because if everything is futile in the end, I might as well pamper myself and give myself everything my heart desires. If nothing is remembered, then nothing really matters. Though each of us would argue strongly against both of these lies, can't we frequently find ourselves living as though there is nothing above the sun? Every time we choose to align our lives and our hearts with worldly philosophies and worldly lusts and worldly interests, we are saying, in effect, nothing I do matters. Nobody will remember me. There is no difference. Quite the contrast with the way the Bible presents the Christian life. The lost may have no real choice about how they live. They're enslaved to their own sin. But we do. We are meant to be sober, vigilant, and to operate as though the direction we take in life and the things we invest ourselves in do matter. Because they do. They matter eternally. We need to understand that every ungodly influence that we encounter in this world is preaching the same thing. Live your life as though nothing matters, as though there is no judgment or accountability in any of it. 
If the wise man ends up just like the fool, then both of them might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I want to continue re to reiterate, it's kind of tough for us to view life from this perspective. I find that it is nearly impossible to see existence in the frame of reference offered by Ecclesiastes. Don't allow that to confuse you, though. Many of the statements and arguments made in this book, they're not God's arguments, they're man's. It is man that believes that the wise and the fool are the same. We know that godly wisdom and worldly foolishness are not the same. It is man that believes that nothing will be remembered and all is futile. We know that God remembers everything and that a life lived in his service is not futile. So we that are saved are coming at this from a very different perspective. But just because we're saved doesn't mean we can't make choices to live more in line with what men think about life. Are we really living our lives like nothing we do will be remembered? Like it doesn't matter. Like there's no difference between wisdom and foolishness. I hope none of the issues we've raised this morning are present in the lives of the people listening to this message. If they are, then you're on the fast track towards damaging the blessing of the new life God gives to you at salvation. And for those of you that are listening to this and you know that you don't have a relationship with God, I hope you can start to see the uncertainty and instability of a life lived apart from God. I can't convince you of your need for Christ. Only God can do that through the application of his word. But what I can tell you is that apart from the Lord, the only expectation you should have for life is one of hatred, bondage, and sin. That's it. Those are the works of the flesh, and they result not only in eternal judgment and in separation from God, but in a wasted life. Solomon says in conclusion, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought unto the Son is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That word therefore tells us the king is referencing everything that's come before this verse. All of the work and the wisdom and the human effort. Despite giving himself every gift known to man, despite seeking wisdom and knowledge, despite living as though there was nothing higher than the sun, Solomon hated his life. That word grievous is the same word as sore in sore travail back in chapter 1. The king said that all the work done under the sun was evil to him. It was unsatisfying. It was ultimately useless. All of it was like the wind, and it only made his desire for purpose and meaning stronger. And so the question coming to us out of a text like this is, are you ready to do some work above the sun, some work that really matters? If you are lost, are you really going to keep clinging to your sin and all that you care about here while forfeiting your soul? You might gain the whole world, the Bible says, but what does it matter if you lose your soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Responding to the gospel, setting aside your pride and submitting to Christ, that's the only way to be delivered from the vanity spoken about here. And though this message goes out most strongly to the lost, there is also a powerful challenge for those of us that are saved. Why would we ever do things that would contribute to the condition spoken of in verse 17? Why would we ever turn to things that will only bring us a hatred for life? The lesson is clear. If you want to fully appreciate what God has given to you, and if you want to have a life that's worth loving, you have to let go of some things. John 12, 25 says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. We can't give ourselves whatever we want. We can't chase after worldly wisdom or recognition, and we can't live this life like nothing really matters. Some very basic points today, but certainly a good reminder for me and for everybody else. Let's pray.